Hello, everybody. How's it going? Um, thanks for joining us again for another one of these uh, live streams that we've been doing on a weekly basis. Um, I know a lot of you probably maybe saw yesterday's presentation um, with uh, Education Ambassador Lindsay Lochner. This week, we're talking all about the Northwest Atlantic White Shark Puzzle, something that uh, I am extremely excited about. Um, and I'm even more excited about this presentation this week because we have um, an incredible lineup of folks here to talk about what exactly the white shark is, white shark puzzle is, and why it's so important. We have uh, several members of our science team here. These are some of the, you know, these are the guys who really put the brains to the science, and so it's going to be awesome to hear from them. We also have our um, founding chairman and expedition leader, Chris Fisher, uh, to talk all about just what exactly we mean when we talk about the white shark puzzle. Um, it in fact is a puzzle. There are some pieces that are coming together and then there are some pieces that we are still working on. Uh, please everybody leave comments, um, questions if you have them. If it's appropriate, I will interrupt whoever's talking right away uh, and ask your question. Otherwise, I'm gonna try and save them all uh, until the end. Um, so I, I will be keeping track of all of that. Um, I also want to let you guys know that today's presentation is uh, presented by Burke Kanani Jewelry. Um, makes fantastic, very, very pretty pieces. Mother's Day is just around the corner. Uh, if you've got a mom who definitely who is into kind of that shark, shark stuff. Um, and then Ocean Family Games lets you, you know, play games, save the ocean. So with that, real quick, I'm going to introduce you to... Um, who we have here to present the white shark puzzle. Uh, we have Chris Fisher. Um, many of you already know him. He's our founding chairman, expedition leader. We also have Lisa Hoops from the Georgia Aquarium. Um, she has been working with, how, how long have you been working with OSEARCH for, Lisa? I'm going on my seventh year, actually, if you can seventh? believe that. Yeah. <laughs> Does a lot of really cool work, both with white sharks, tiger sharks, all kinds of different sharks. Uh, we have uh, Harley Newton from Wildlife Conservation Society's New York Aquarium. And Harley, it's been about a, a similar amount of time that you've been with OSEARCH, right? Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been with them since 2016. She is also our veterinarian who's on the lift with us when we do have the shark, taking those blood samples, very important part of our team. And rounding out today's uh, panel is Dr. Bob Huter from Mount Marine Laboratory. He is OSEARCH's Chief Science Advisor. So welcome everybody. We are very glad to have you all here. Before we get started, guys, uh, like I said, I am extremely excited about this presentation. So, you know, go. Uh, I think this is going to be a good one. I encourage you all to use that share button, uh, spread it around to your friends, let people know exactly what is going on here today. Um, so with that, let's talk a little bit about the white shark puzzle and exactly what we mean when we talk about it. Chris, I think, um, I don't know if you coined the term. Did you coin the term white shark puzzle? Or I guess I'm going to turn it over to Chris to quickly explain what we mean when we are saying a uh, white shark puzzle. Um, you know, I don't know where the term came from. When I started getting involved with these scientists, it was it seemed like the easiest way to explain what we were trying to do because we're definitely trying to put together a very complex ancient puzzle that goes back millions of years. Um, and so, you know, we got Dr. Hoops, Dr. Newton, and Dr. Huter, who can give you a more technical kind of explanation behind the life history puzzle. And I try to just kind of speak in a way that's just, um, you know, really easy to understand. You know, we're basically trying to understand as they go through their life, where do they live and what are they doing? So where are they mating? Where are they birthing? Um, what's their full migratory path? Where are the females gestating? Once you find the birthing site, then identifying the nursery in the areas they live in the first couple of years of their lives. That's where they're most vulnerable. That's the most important thing to look after and locate uh, these nurseries and then document the range of that nursery. But I think it's important also to say, you know, why are we doing this work? Why, you, why, why does it matter? Why, shark, why solve the, life shark, the white shark life history puzzle? Well, much like the wolf in Yellowstone, as they go, the system goes. And historically, our white shark populations were down very low due to thinning around the world, and as well as just a lot of pressure on them. 
uh, up until the 90s when they were protected and they've started to make a nice rebound, but we were down to about 9% of our large sharks. And they prevent the second tier of the food chain from running amok and wiping out all the food for our kids to eat in the future. And we did not have the data around their lives because they were so big, no one had able to, ever been able to put this life history puzzle together. So we're solving the life history puzzle of the white shark and that's cool, but why we do it is to make sure all our great grandkids have food to eat and fish sandwiches. And, and I think that's important um, because the work is part of, you know, the long-term health of the ocean. And if we lose the ocean, we lose the planet. And so that's why we do the work. And we're trying to solve this puzzle to bring those white sharks back from the brink so that we have a balanced, abundant ocean and lots of fish for our kids to eat in the future. Very good. And so a lot of times, a lot of you are probably familiar with our OSEARCH map and the tracker. Um, and so putting locations to where these sharks are, but the white shark puzzle goes beyond just figuring out locations. Um, Dr. Hoops, a lot of your work um, has to do with like the diet and, and physiology. So can you explain sort of how beyond just like physical locations, what, you know, what there is to the white shark puzzle beyond just those those locations? Oh, absolutely. So we, we definitely want to know where these animals are moving. Um, but while they're spending time in these different habitats, we want to know what they're doing and what resources they might be relying on in those habitats. We also want to know their general overall health. Um, how healthy are they? How how are their environments impacting their overall health, their ability to find food and to forage? And how does that um, help in their conservation status? It also provides us a really nice baseline going forward in a very changing world. So how are these animals going to change under the pressures of a changing climate or increased pollution in the oceans? So a lot of great health and physiological information is also being collected on how these animals um, use their habitat and what they're doing while they're there. Sorry, I was on my, so as we talk about uh, the puzzle, there are very much um, some, whoops, I jumped. There are very much pieces to this puzzle. Um, and so we have, some of them are definitely falling into place. And really quick, I do wanna to touch on some of these pieces uh, that are coming into place. Our work started in 2012 in Cape Cod. Chris, uh, you know, can you explain how Cape Cod fits into this puzzle and why we started our work in, in Cape Cod to begin with? Well, we started our work in Cape Cod because we started to see that there were some white sharks showing up there in, in front of the seals in the 2007, 2008, 2009, really kind of 2000, you know, that time frame, maybe a slightly later. Um, and so when you start and you go into a region and you're trying to solve a puzzle like this, the hardest part is getting the first few animals for the science team to work up and to begin laying down some tracks. And since we knew they were being seen there in the late summer and fall, we started out there in 12 and 13 and we tagged four white sharks up there. We also tagged one off the Southeastern United States in between. Um, and that's really where it began. And the shark started to slowly reveal the full range of these animals, which were all females, uh, mostly mature. And basically it was just going there because we knew there were some there so they could show us where to look for them in other parts of the Northwest Atlantic. Excellent. So piece of, one of the pieces of the puzzle, wait, like, so I guess Dr. Heater, um, this could be a question for you. Is Cape Cod an aggregation site or what What word could we use to put to, to Cape Cod in terms of defining it as a piece? Well, um, Cape Cod is, is really a, a site where the, where the sharks are going to feed. And as the, as the seal population has rebounded over, over the last 30, 30 or 40 years of protection of the, of the seals as prey, the, the white sharks, um, with their protection, it's been in for about the last uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, or sorry, about the last 20, 30 years has has also rebounded, and um, so that so the sharks are going there primarily to feed on seals and other sorts of prey, and they're aggregated there not for some social reason, but because that's where the food is, and an aggregation uh, means 
higher density of animals, which gives us more access to the animals. And it's a good place, therefore, to then sample those animals and tag them and release them. And what time of year are we talking about there? So this is a summertime aggregation. And um, as Chris said, this was known back into the 2000s and probably to the, and to the fishermen even before that. But it had not been studied in any great depth until, until really the, the 2010s. And we started our work there in 2012 and have, have uh, gone back there um, every year we can since then. So another piece of the puzzle uh, since we started in 2012 that's kind of fallen into place is, is identifying a nursery in basically the New York Bay area. Um, Dr. Newton, that's kind of your neck of the woods. You were there on those expeditions. Can you explain a little bit why it's so important to be able to identify what a white shark nursery is and how we were able to help uh, with that? Sure. Um, so a nursery site um, for sharks is a really um, important um, feeding area and growing area for a very vulnerable life stage. So a lot of different shark species use them. So it's really important to identify these areas so that we know where these pups are, when they're there, and also what resources are important to them. Um, so as part of um, identifying this site, there had been, you know, uh, reports going back to the 60s and also in the 80s of white shark um, pups being caught. Um, and the research that we started doing in 2016 and 2017 was really focused on, con you know, confirming that, confirming that there are a large number of white shark pups um, in the New York Bight region during a certain period of time. And we were able to confirm that. So Chris, a lot of times I hear you refer to this, the nursery sites as the holy grail of the research. Why why do you say holy grail of the research? Well, I mean, much like any animal or people ourselves, these animals are much more vulnerable when they're young. You know, they're born four and a half feet, 45 pounds, and live super coastal there. They're in the New York, New Jersey bite, uh, you know, from the late spring, early summer into the fall when the water starts to cool down. And these are little four and a half foot, 45 pound sharks. So they can get caught up in long lines and they can get caught up in, gill nets and other things like that and then uh, as the weather cools they start migrating down the beaches of the eastern coast of the united states down into the carolinas and so they're moving up and down those beaches the first couple years of their lives and then that starts to extend further south as they get older now that is where they're most vulnerable if they don't make it out of the nursery we don't end up with any big mature animals you know at mating sites or in some of these summer and fall feeding aggregations so uh, that is where the animal is most vulnerable and understanding how they move through it and helping them get to where they're big enough that when they come into contact with gear types in the water, they can just break them because they're a larger animal. It is the real trick to helping the white sharks come back. So Dr. Here, we talked about, I'll, I'll turn over uh, piece number three, another piece just within the last couple of years that's really started uh, coming into place is what we call the Northwest Atlantic Shared Foraging Area or, or NASFA. Can you help people understand what the NASFA is and, and why it's so important and where it is? Sure. So um, when we look at what has been uh, accomplished in terms of white shark research in the Eastern Pacific, where Chris and his crew uh, had a major contribution back in the in the early 2000s, understanding that puzzle, uh, we saw an area, or they saw an area, they defined an area called SOFA or the White Shark Cafe, which is a it's an, an offshore foraging area where uh, groups of white sharks come together to feed. And um, in trying to put together this jigsaw puzzle then in the Northwest Atlantic, where we know we knew so little. Uh, we started to see through our telemetry data, these, uh, these larger sharks, uh, actually sharks of, of both sexes and, si and, all, and all sizes, um, working this area in the wintertime that was off the Carolinas uh, down to North Florida. So we've, we've, uh, we've had a number of expeditions in that area to try to sort of fill in those pieces. And what we've 
what we have um, named this area then is the NASFA area, the North West Atlantic Shared Foraging Area, where again, sharks that go to different places in the summertime seem to come together on mass to, to feed uh, primarily in the, in the late fall, winter and early spring months. And that's where our sharks have been up until, up until um, now for this, this yearly cycle. So I, there is a, uh, since we're talking about the NASFA, there is kind of an important question or not, a question that came in here. Um, you know, the, the uh, Kathy is from North Carolina. They're seeing on the tracker out, Bob, I'm sorry, I'm covering up your face. And maybe we'll let Chris take this question since Bob is <laughs> a little bit anonymous, but talking about the NASFA, North Carolina falls into the NASFA. So, you know, can you help Kathy out here with, uh, her yeah, 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 Kathy. First of all, it's so exciting to see people are like people are on from all over the world. We're getting shout outs from Columbus, Spain, Northwest Florida. I mean, hi, Maryland, Georgia. This is awesome. Um, so what's going on in the Carolinas? Well, one of the coolest things I think that's happening this year in the Carolinas is the fact that because we've tagged so many sharks in Nova Scotia over the past two years, we have about, I don't know, somewhere between 15 and 20 actively pinging white sharks. And so it's allowing us to see things that we didn't have an opportunity to see if we only had two or four pinging white sharks because anything that clustered was just a couple of sharks. And, you know, that was just a couple of sharks. But we have so many sharks that it became pinging this year that it became really apparent something was going on up in North Carolina, just south of um, Cape Hatteras you know, going down through Cape Fear and Cape Lookout. And we had about six, seven, eight sharks hanging out there. So the main thing we start to see this time of year, and it started a month or so ago, is the sharks start moving north, right? They're starting to push north because they're going to want to slide up, like Bob mentioned earlier, off of either Cape Cod or off of Nova Scotia to feed on some marine mammal this summer, you know, and fall and bulk up. And, but a lot of times what happens at Cape Hatteras is the Gulf Stream comes plowing into Cape Hatteras. They're very close before it bounces up to the northeast. And it keeps a really cold body of water pinned above Cape Hatteras. The water's really cold, like 50 degrees, 47 degrees. And these white sharks really love this 60 degree temperature or so. And so they start making their way northbound and they start trying to come around Cape Hatteras and all of a sudden, boom, they hit a big temperature break and it's cold. And so they pause, right? And what a great place to pause. They can stay down in the water temperatures they like, you know, cruise around in the 60s. It's very close from the beach if they want to get on a red drum run or a black drum run or eat some food there or slide right out to the western edge of the Gulf Stream and maybe eat bluefin tuna or mahi or billfish, they eat whatever they want, whatever they want, right? Squid. And so they get pushed up in there as the season starts and there was a cold body of water that was really cold up and just till about two, three days ago. And it's starting to break a little bit now and we're starting to see our first couple sharks make it around Cape Hatteras as they got warmer water to kind of ride on up to the Northeast end. So they got pinned in there. Now I'm suspicious that, it, that water temperature is a huge part of it, but a lot of them were there for a long, long time before that water was going to warm up and they stayed there for a long time. So I think, I think, you know, that's a place where we have to get the ship if we continue to see this trend for a future expedition. So one thing about working in the Nashville region is it's hard, but we've uh, learned that the sharks that we tag there, have potential to lead us to some pretty big breakthroughs. Um, so real quick, we'll take a quick look at some of the sharks that have helped us, you know, discover some new, some new sites. One of the really fascinating things about working here in, in the Southeast is, uh, you know, the sharks that we tag here have really uh, led us to new discoveries, uh, mainly with, with places that um, we didn't really understand that these sharks used or used uh, all that frequently. Uh, the first one for us was Lydia, and was the first shark on the tracker anyway to venture into Atlantic Canadian waters. But at the time, you know, we weren't sure if that was an outlier or not. And then came Hilton, uh, named after Hilton Head, South Carolina. And Hilton really showed us the area of Nova Scotia. Um, using that area multiple years in a row, 
um, potentially showing another summer habitat for the population. And then, you know, continuing the pattern, last year we were able to tag Brunswick in this region and, and Brunswick showed us yet another area by kind of looping around Nova Scotia and venturing uh, off the coast of New Brunswick up in Canada. So, you know, as it seems that most of the population during the, the winter months uh, come down into this region, you know, it's really important for us because we can sample um, sharks that are potentially from anywhere in the population uh, because they are concentrating in this region as the waters cool further north. Any new shark that we tag in this region, you know, has the potential of, of leading us to new areas and to new discoveries. And so a lot of the sharks we tagged down there did lead us to piece number four of the puzzle, Nova Scotia. Um, Dr. Newton, you've been up to Nova Scotia a couple of times now. Um, why, why is Nova, what is the importance of Nova Scotia? What are we learning about the importance of Nova Scotia that, that it really makes it one of these important pieces of this white shark puzzle that's uh, starting to form? I mean, really, one of the most important things about Nova Scotia that we're learning is just that there's sharks present there. I mean, as Chris has, has said, you know, in the past um, on some of these, I mean, these animals have definitely been there for a long time. We just happen to um, be able to now gain access to them. And through the tags that we use, we're able to follow their tracks and see how they interconnect with all these other populations um, and aggregation sites that we already knew about. Um, they're also there during a season that's really important to study. Um, and it's a very different environment. So it's going to be important to understand, you know, what food resources are important to them there, um, how their health compares to other parts of the world where there's different levels of pollution um, and different uh, sea changes happening. So all in all, this Nova Scotia piece is kind of a mind blowing, really important piece that's come together. D yeah, Dr. Heater, you have something to add? John, I, and, and to, to add to what Dr. Newton said, this is, this is something that is a true OSEARCH discovery, which is the, the importance of Atlantic Canada to this, this overall population in the Northwest Atlantic. Before we started our work in Nova Scotia in 2018, and we did that because the sharks took us there, sharks like Hilton and Lydia, Nobody knew that that uh, Nova Scotia was that important. The Canadians really considered white shark to be endangered in their waters and not not that present. Uh, maybe a few dozen observations over hundreds of years. We went up there and, and caught animals right away and started tagging them and have, have opened up everybody's eyes to how important um, that area is and how far north these animals go. So this is something that we clearly can uh, claim as a true OSEARCH discovery, that is the importance of Nova Scotia as a, as a feeding site in the summertime, in addition to some of the other better known areas like Cape Cod. Excellent. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything they want to add about Nova Scotia? Because, well, I guess we'll watch a quick uh, video on just because this was one of the most uh, exciting expeditions we've had in a little while. So just a quick recap of that expedition. We just concluded Expedition Nova Scotia 2019. This trip was game changing. We were able to collect samples from 11 sharks and this is going to change our projects and get us the results we need to do amazing science. It's been tremendous to see what actually happened on this expedition. There are more sharks here than anyone ever dreamed of. Sharks of many different profiles, males and females, young and old, and everything in between.
That's all right. That's the best trip ever. <laughs> Incredible trip. Best one I've ever had. Can't wait to come back next year. The next steps are to sit down with DFO, which is Canada's version of NOAA, and put together a long-term plan, a five-year plan, a seven-year plan, to make sure we answer the questions that they need to be answered so that they can manage these large sharks toward abundance. And so we just talked about a lot of the pieces that came together um, that are all a lot of the pieces. Dr. Huter, you put this graphic together real, real quick. Do you want to explain the graphic um, before we move on to some of the unsolved pieces of the puzzle so that we can look forward to the future of what OSEARCH is going to be doing next? But you did put this graphic together, so I want to give you a chance to explain it and where all the pieces we just talked about are. Sure. So, um very quickly, uh, the the pink rectangle there is that's the that area off of Long Island that we confirmed as a nursery through our tagging work of our of our twenty uh, uh, young of the year sharks. And in the after they're born there in um, somewhere around June July, um, then they start moving later in the fall down south to off of the Carolinas. So that's that uh, that first white arrow. And basically these animals start doing this coastal uh, migration back and forth with the seasons ex slowly expanding until finally as they get older and bigger, you get, you get a range that encompasses that entire uh, white polygon that runs from Newfoundland into the east, actually the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. And the areas that are important then uh, include the nursery, of course, and then those summer feeding aggregation sites, which we now know include Cape Cod and Nova Scotia, and perhaps some other undiscovered areas as, yet, as of yet. In the wintertime, the Northwest Atlantic Shared Foraging Area <clears throat> is where they come together um, in this broad area off the Carolinas and, and Georgia to feed. And then you see these big loops. Those are all, all those dots out there, those are all pings uh, primarily from our biggest females. And we believe those are, um, those are areas where the, the pregnant females go to gestate their young. So this is the model, what we call the, white, the Northwest Atlantic white shark model that we're now trying to fill in. And we're getting pretty close to, to confirming all of these areas and filling in the last pieces of this giant jigsaw puzzle. Cool. So let's see. We've talked about some of the pieces that have come together. Now it's time for, you know, some of the pieces. This is where, like I said at the top of the call, this is these are these are our collaborating scientists. We're in touch on a weekly basis. And what this next part was when we really put our brains together and start figuring out what OSEARCH is going to do next and start, you know, seeing which pieces of the puzzle we need to solve next. So one of the one of the hypotheses we're working on right now is whether or not there could be a second white shark nursery, perhaps somewhere up in Canada. Dr. Huter, do you want to explain a little bit about why we have this hypothesis and what um, what evidence we have right now to support it, you know, and, and what we'll have to do uh, in order to confirm or deny its existence? Dr. Huter, you are muted. I muted my mic instead of unmuting it. Um, we, we still have some open questions about the reproductive cycle, these animals. Um, you know, supposedly the, the scientific dogma that's there is that they have an 18 month uh, pregnancy or gestation cycle. And if you project back 18 months from uh, June or July off of New York, then you get into winter of the previous year and the whole thing looks starts to look like it's it it doesn't work in terms of the time frame. So we're we're working on two things. One is to see if there are other nurseries other than j just the one uh, that we confirmed off of Long Island and the other is to find where they're mating. And that's the really that's the tough one. Um, that's the one that's even affected by such things as whether or not the the females after they mate can store the sperm and wait to fertilize their eggs. That, that really makes things very complicated, but very interesting from a biological standpoint. And we know that other shark species are able to do that. 
And Chris, I just wanted to bring up. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things that um, you know, uh, I think it's also why a second nursery. You know, from our work out in the Pacific um, at Guadalupe Island and at the Farallones Islands, we found those sharks had multiple birthing sites, both on the inside of Baja and up in the Sea of Cortez, and also on the outside of Baja, on the Pacific side. And so very important to understand if there's another nursery beyond this long uh, New York, New Jersey bite um, to so that we can look after it because that's where the sharks are most vulnerable. And we've seen that in other bodies of water. So will the puzzle repeat itself in the Atlantic? I would be um, surprised, uh, you know, the, the real way to do that. And, and I think we're going to move on to some other things that will answer some of these questions. But we have a couple of large females tagged from Nova Scotia. Will those animals go to the same area where Mary Lee went and where we confirmed was a birthing area and a nursery? Or will they go somewhere else? Does the Canadian white shark give birth in a place different than the northeastern United States white shark? Um, it's super important. As we said, it's the holy grail of science. It's where the animals are most vulnerable. I find it hard to believe an animal that's been around for a couple hundred million years would have... Um, a single nursery strategy because that likely would not endure um, natural selection over that length of time. It's not diversified, right? There's no redundancy. Um, so we're, we're waiting to see if we find a shark that takes us to a different place than Long Island in that time frame Bob spoke about in that May, June time frame. that's a large female to see if we need to go try to find other baby sharks in that region. Hugely important piece of the puzzle and it's missing right now. Unamaki and Luna are the two hopefuls right now that could show us something around the Canadian white sharks birthing area. And that would happen like coming up soon, next couple months. So something that everybody can follow along on the tracker to see, you know, well, we watch the tracker just like all of you do. It, it, comes to us live. Nobody out there necessarily has to jump on any of the data that we do. So, you know, you pull it up and you see Luna and, and Unamaki somewhere. And you're learning about it at the exact same time as we are, which I think is pretty cool. Let's touch quickly on um, perhaps another missing piece. Maybe it, maybe it is a missing piece. Maybe it's not. It's perhaps something we don't know too much about. Um, Dr. Huter, I think I'll let you touch on this real quick. We, it's, we do have some pings in the Gulf of Mexico, but, you know, what do we know about it? you know, so far. And we'll just make this one kind of quick. Yeah, I think the I'm I'm talking to you from Sarasota, Florida on the on the Gulf Coast of of, of the Florida Peninsula. <clears throat> and the people here are, are are surprised to know, to be surprised to learn that we have white sharks off off the coast here, but they don't come up on the beach like they do on the East Coast. They don't they don't travel up uh, right along the beach like like on the east coast of Florida and even parts of the Carolinas, but they stay out uh, pretty far offshore, 50 to 100 miles. And in fact, the large sharks and even the, some of the, the mid-sized sharks that we've tagged have shown this to us, that a certain contingent of sharks does come into the eastern Gulf of Mexico. Um, and we've even had one, Unamaki now, who, who crossed over to the, to the slightly into the western Gulf side, um, past the Mississippi River. So this, we don't know what part this plays in the, in the puzzle. Um, it's obviously a feeding area. Um, whether it has any reproductive function, doubtful, but we'll see. So Dr. Hoops and Dr. Newton, like we talked about, it's the, the white track puzzle isn't all about um, these physical locations. It's also understanding physiology and whatnot. And right now, there is a lot that we don't know about white shark reproduction. Um, so Dr. Newton or Dr. Hoops, I think a lot of people might be surprised about this question, but what can you tell us about what we know about where white sharks are mating? Do we? I mean, I can take this, Lisa, if you want. Um, the reality is we don't know. Yeah. Still very much working on that question. Uh, the only female animal we've ever encountered that had um, mating wounds which are bite marks um, that the female receives from the male um, during that process was off of Georgia in about June um, of 2017. 
So really, we're still trying to work on that process, but we're going about it in two different ways. Um, there's a group at the University of North Florida led by Dr. Jim Gelslicher, who um, is studying um, hormone levels. And it's the same hormones that you're familiar with, things like um, estradiol and testosterone, and looking at those levels, seeing when they're at their peak, which would give us a good clue as to whether these animals are reproductively active or not. Um, the other methods that we're using um, are ultrasound. So when we have these animals on the platform, it's really the only way that we can look internally and look at the size of the um, reproductive organs, whether they're active or not, and giving us a sense of when these animals might be reproductively active. The other thing that we're looking at is semen quality. Um, you can collect semen um, from sharks um, most easily when they're most reproductively active. And there's a couple different important things that you wanna look at. You wanna look at the amount of semen that you're able to collect and the activity of that semen when you look at it on the microscope, like whether it's ready to go or whether it's still dormant. Uh, that work is being done by Mike Hyatt, who's at WCS, and also uh, Jennifer Wiffles with CSARC. Um, and what we're seeing right now um, is the best quality semen sample that we've collected so far was in March of 2017. Um, that was from Hilton. Um, and that um, to date is the best sample that we have. It was both the best quality and it also had the best motility. Um, we've collected um, four other samples from animals in Nova Scotia. Um, those animals had um, much smaller semen vol um, volume available and they all were also less modal. So it's less likely that those animals were um, reproductively active when we sampled them in the fall um, than this animal that we sampled in the spring. Lisa, do you wanna add anything? No, I, I think you've covered it great. I think we're starting to zero in on this one. I think the next year is going to be very exciting. Fingers crossed for a pregnant female. Um, yeah, I think so too. That, that's the one we're, we're, we're keeping our fingers crossed for. Yeah. Yeah, and we were, we were very fortunate this year um, in uh, Nova Scotia to have a donor donate um, an ultrasound that can permanently live on the ship. And I cannot tell you how important that piece of equipment is to have, to have access to all the time. Um, OSEARCH made a commitment um, after 2016 to always have a veterinarian on board, um, in addition to a lot of the researchers that study um, reproductive biology. So we always have someone there who can use an ultrasound and can really thoroughly look at these animals. So it's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, and again, uh, for all of you at home, Keep an eye on Unamaki in this regard, because if she's not pregnant, if she's not moving toward a nursery site, be it off Long Island or, or a second nursery, maybe this is her year to mate. And she just made a move um, uh, out over this broad shelf area that's um, very similar to where we got Hilton and in the same time of year. So. So knowing that Hilton was was ready to mate when we found him in, in March or so of, of one year uh, in this shelf area off the Carolinas and then seeing Unamaki kind of start to work in that area and her being a big, obviously adult female, uh, keep an eye because she may, she may be mating out there if she's not uh, going to go out offshore and gestate her young. So another uh, big piece of the puzzle, like we talked about, it is taking a look at the overall health of the population. And Dr. Newton, this is really at, at the, the core of some of your work. Um, what, are, what are we learning about the health of white sharks in the Northwest Atlantic so far? Sure. I mean, uh, like a lot of the research going on here, we're honestly just creating a baseline. I think as Lisa said so succinctly at the beginning, you know, it's important to collect this information now because the ocean is changing and the baseline health information that we get now may change over time. So we all take for granted that when we go to the doctor or when we take our pets to the vet, they have normal values to compare to. Um, and those are very specific there by, you know, by what age you are, what sex you are. And for sharks, we're lucky if we have like a species that we can compare to. So we've been really fortunate um, to be able to collect health samples on all of these sharks. Um, we have some really nice baseline information on what their normal red blood cell count is, what their normal white blood cell count looks like. And then we're also 
starting to be able to look at how those parameters change as we travel along the coast and travel with seasons. So I would say overall the population health at this point compared to other shark species um, looks uh, pretty good. Um, in addition, um, we are seeing some changes in the southeast that um, do suggest um, higher um, inflammatory counts and also some inflammatory markers. That's interesting um, in that the animals are otherwise healthy. Um, so we're trying to figure out that little uh, piece of the puzzle at the moment. Um, but overall, I would say um, the health parameters that we've been looking at are very positive. Harley, Harley, why don't you just take a second and tell them the difference between what you're seeing up north and what you're seeing down south in a little bit more layman's terms. And I don't know if we're going to get to diet or not, but Lisa has some great stuff. Yeah. One of the things that's important, everybody, that most people in a normal research situation, these researchers don't have the capacity to work on the same body of sharks across their entire migratory range. But with O-Search in the ship, we can provide that to them. So Bob and Harley and Lisa are doing their work up in Nova Scotia and they're getting all these markers for their various things that they're looking at. Then they're on the same body of sharks when they're down off the southeastern United States or Florida and getting samples there and they can compare the differences. And if you didn't have a mobile team of 30 collaborators in a ship, the old model of science, which is an, an individual scientist at a location, just studies that location and always gets the same data set. Right. And so then they're not working across the whole range and makes it very difficult to put the puzzle together. So I think it's really interesting if you all can start talking about how you've been compare and contrast these different issues across the different regions, because we have a luxury of being on the same body of sharks over different times of the year in different parts of its migratory range. Yeah, I, I cannot stress enough how and how critical it is that we have so many teams of people involved with their own specialties, looking at their own interests that then you can tap into. So um, as I was saying, you know, when we have animals in the South, you know, I, I think everyone's familiar with a white blood cell count and how when it's high, it means that um, you are showing signs of inflammation. And if it's, if it's low or normal, um, that means that you're not showing signs of inflammation. One of the other things that we look at are kind of the ratios of the types of white blood cells there. So we'll do something in sharks that's called a granulocyte to lymphocyte ratio. Um, and what we're seeing is um, that that ratio is altered in a way in these animals in the South that would suggest that they are having some sort of immune system response. In addition, our livers um, make special proteins called acute phase proteins. Um, one of them is called C-reactive protein, which you may be familiar with if you've ever um, then looked at for whether you had a heart attack or some sort of cardiac event, but it's a really good marker of either a stressor or some sort of inflammatory event. We have actually found that that is a useful marker in sharks. Um, and we're seeing elevations in that level in the animals um, in the Southeast as well. So there's something about that time period. So the spring period and that region um, that is causing some type of response. And what's great is that I've been able to share this information with the people studying reproduction, the people studying toxicology with Lisa, and we're trying to piece together what it might be about this region in this season that's stimulating that response. And so Dr. Hoops, like we were just talking about, she's seeing two differences and being able to be on the same body of sharks. A lot of question that OSEARCH gets all the time is what sharks, what are sharks eating? Um, which is kind of the, the focus of a lot of your work. Can you tell us, are you seeing any differences between shark diets versus and where they're tagged? Yeah, of course. We're um, with a number of other collaborators using a, a couple of techniques to try and get at the diet question for these guys. Because understanding what they're feeding on in these different regions is another layer of trying to understand protection and how these animals are using their habitat. Um, and so what we are beginning to see with some of this diet data is that we have very distinct diets across life history stages, and that's probably not surprising. Um, we know that the young of the year are feeding on something very different than the juveniles and the adults. And we see very distinct regional differences as well. So most of the animals in the southeast are probably feeding on more fish-based um, diets or cephalopod-based diets, squid, those types of things. 
where in the north we see very distinct dietary patterns that shift more toward a marine mammal. Um, and we had some really great evidence of that while we were in Nova Scotia in 2019. Um, as we were collecting fecal samples from these sharks, we actually saw hair from the um, seals in the area in the fecal sample. And that matches up with some of the, the blood data and the muscle data that we're getting from these animals when we're looking at the chemical components of those tissues, they match a marine mammal signature. So we're really starting to tease out not only um, how these animals are using the areas, but particularly what types of prey they may be leaning on when they are in these various life stages, but all these also these different locations. And I think just to, real quickly to touch base on that, you should, um, you know, talk a little bit about um, both either you or Harley about, you know, what we're seeing with microplastics, you know, not because these animals are eating these different things, right? They are a bioaccumulator. They are at the top of the food chain. So by understanding what they eat and how many toxins are coming into their system, we can get a picture of the general ocean health in the region. So, you know, it's always good to help people understand the why, you know, not just what we're doing, right? So maybe you can talk a little bit about that across the whole team, because I think it's fascinating what you've been doing in the last few years when it comes to the toxicology side, the, the microplastic side, and, and the differences in the regions, if you're seeing any differences in the regions. We'll actually jump to that in one sec, Chris. Um, that is coming up in the next slide, because I that is an incredibly important part, but I also wanted to bring up, um, the fact that one thing that uh, Dr. Hoops just mentioned is, you know, there is so much going on on the ship and people get so fascinated with the, the, um, the tracker and being able to follow these sharks in real time. Um, and Dr. Hoops just mentioned it incredibly, but there's a whole lot more going on. Um, and I think this video is a demonstration of, of exactly what Lisa just mentioned about uh, making some pretty incredible observations out in the field that go well beyond this tracking. And then we'll get to what Chris was talking about, how, wrapping this all up and why this is important. We've put spot tags out on white sharks during this expedition, but there's a whole lot more going on than just tagging sharks. One of the coolest things that we've seen this trip has been the presence of hair in one of the fecal samples from our white sharks. Now it makes sense that they might be feeding on seals while they're out here, but this is just great evidence to suggest that that is exactly what they're doing. So that leads us down a path of, of trying to understand their diet a little bit better. Another really exciting discovery is we were able to get sperm from mature male white shark fur. We were able to look at it under the microscope and see the motility of the sperm. The more sperm samples we collect and study gives us greater ability to try and understand reproductive readiness in these male sharks. Has he just reproduced? Is he getting ready to reproduce? So many questions left still to answer. Another really cool thing that we've seen on this expedition is an actual white shark heartbeat. We used an ultrasound on blue nose and got some great images. We measured 10 beats per minute. That's really cool. As far as I know, nobody else has done that. This is a really first start at looking at heart rate and metabolism in these animals. We've got a lot more data that we're hoping to collect so that we can learn more about the life history of these beautiful creatures here in Nova Scotia. So this, so like, like you can see, there's a lot going on on the ship that all of these scientists have been talking about that goes well beyond that spot tag. That spot tag is obviously incredibly important to a lot of the work and it helps put reference points to some of the other things, but there's a lot going on. And now we get to exactly what Chris was asking in terms of why, why we're doing this, you know, the implications that we have, uh, that this has, by being able to study sharks, we're able to look at, you know, the overall health of the ocean. So do you guys want to answer Chris? What was your question again for, for Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I think just talk about making people understand their bioaccumulators, what you're seeing between the north and the south and the various different samples, microplastics, toxins, and then we'll talk about medicine. Sure. Um, well, we do have a researcher from Stony Brook that is interested in looking at contaminants in these animals and also um, impacts of microplastics um, in their system. And 
that really ties nicely with the research that the rest of us are doing because, um, because we've all sampled the same animals, we can pinpoint specific animals that may have high loads of contaminants, which are accumulated through the food chain. So as the um, toxins get into the system, they start at the bottom of the food chain and they biomagnify or they increase as you move up the food chain. So since white sharks are at the top of the food chain, they're probably eating food items that are pretty heavily impacted with some of these contaminants or heavy metals or even microplastics. Um, and so being able to pinpoint that in individual animals, um, I can go back and look at the dietary data for that same animal. And then Harley can also look at the health markers on that animal as well. So we can begin to get a holistic picture of animal health and how that may be changed with their diet um, through environmental influences and how that changes over the life history. So that's really the beauty of having multiple um, researchers working off the same animal because although we're tackling questions from different angles, we can rely on the data from the, the other researchers to help us get a more complete picture of what might be happening to these animals. Yeah, and I'll just chime in on the microplastics. Um, so I'm the person who does kind of that first pass analysis, which is basically taking that fecal sample, running it through filters, and doing some microscopy to confirm presence or absence of microplastics. Then we take those plastics and we send them to a laboratory that can identify the plastic type and tell us the origin, and also tell us what other types of contaminants are attached to them. And that's one of the big concerns with microplastics is that they can have other contaminants attached to them which make them accumulate toxins at a higher rate. And I will tell you that 100% of the samples that we have collected from juvenile white sharks all the way up to adults have microplastics in them. So that's, you know, that's just a, you know, a reality check out there. These plastics are impacting these animals. You know, these animals are really the canary in the coal mine. Um, and one of the reasons that we study them is because they are showing us how healthy our oceans are. And that's why we need to understand their health better. In addition to studying all of the different parts of the ocean that are important to them so that we can protect them and conserve the species. And then real quick, just cause we are running out of time just a little bit, but you know, a, a missing piece going beyond sharks, you know, there, there could potentially be some uh, implications for humans in terms of new medicines. Uh, Dr. Hoops, I think, might be the best person to explain how something like that might be possible. Ah, sure, we um, definitely have some researchers that are studying the bacterial community that lives on different surfaces of the white shark. So we, you'll see us out there taking swabs of the teeth and of the skin and of, of various locations on the body of the animal. Um, and that's really to study the bacterial communities that live um, in those regions and to try and understand what type of benefit they provide to the host or to the white shark. Um, but there's also some really interesting research going on to suggest that there um, may be, some of these bacteria may be novel in terms of um, uh, resistance to um, understanding um, uh, Help me out here. What's antibiotics. the antibiotics? Yeah, it's antibiotics. Yeah, so, um, some of our researchers are um, plating these bacteria and growing them out and exposing them to antibiotics and and looking for new discoveries that ultimately may benefit us in terms of, of medicine. Cool, um, John, there's, John. There's there's two ways that that may work. One is that the these bacteria produce their own classes of antibiotics to, to ward off sort of bad bacteria on the shark. And uh, some of those drugs, uh, some of those chemicals may be able to uh, be used as new drugs for us that will help us with the, the kinds of bacteria that we deal with that have already become resistant to our, to our present antibiotics. Um, and the other is that, that um, the bacteria in places like the shark's mouth are being cultured by uh, some of our scientists to look at uh, what antibiotics work best against those should someone ever be bitten and um, and wounds have to be dealt with in terms of uh, you know medical care. So uh, we never would have predicted eight years ago when we started this work that we would be doing that kind of thing. And this, this shows the power of OSEARCH that we're able to add on these new components 
um, that have come up and we're very flexible in doing this. We started out with about 10 projects eight years ago and 15 minutes with the animal. We now are up to 20 projects and we still take 15 minutes with the animal because we've just become so much more efficient. And this all is of those, the power of the science that we're doing. And to kind of sum things up here, all of those projects, all of those different th pieces that you're talking about, Dr. Eater, those are all part of this white chart puzzle that we've been talking about the whole time. Um, so I, I have been looking at some of your questions coming in. We do have time for just a few before we do run out of time. Um, so one of the first ones I just had here, if I can find it, I think um, I'll let whoever wants to take this while I look for the actual question. How old are the sharks that we are getting um, semen samples from? If, if we can even give an answer to that question. Uh, you want me to take that, guys? So the, from what we know about age and growth in these, in these sharks, we think the males uh, mature at somewhere around 20 years old, but that's still subject for, for more uh, research. So uh, the, these animals are probably at least 20, we think, uh, and possibly older if they're, if they're producing viable sperm. Okay, there was another question going back here. I think, Dr. Newton, this will be an important question for you. Um, when people see the, the shark, I'm scrolling back trying to display it, but I can't. It was a little while back, but I made a note of it. So um, when people do see the shark on the lift, there was um, a question about whether that harms the shark being on the lift. That's part of your health study. Can you explain a little bit how we're able to understand what's that it's not harmful? Sure. I mean, part of the process of taking these animals out of the water, we are studying sort of how stressful that event is on the animal. Um, there is a veterinarian on board at all times when we're handling animals. We're not only responsible for our own work, but we're also just responsible solely for monitoring the animals and how they're handling the process. We do have a process of communicating how the animal looks before it comes to the lift to decide whether or not we're um, going to work on the animal. We also have a process of communicating how the animal's doing on the lift. So if we have to cut anything short, we can and we do. Um, in addition to that, we collect blood samples and we do immediate analysis. Um, as soon as we're um, completed, um, that measures blood gas levels and other metabolites. And they really tell us how the animal handled the procedure and how well it was being ventilated when it's on the lift. So one of the most important things that we do is we provide that hose of seawater. That's the ventilation that we're providing for the animal. So we're always very mindful of every single animal we handle when we're picking them up, how well they're ventilated. Um, and I can tell you that these animals are very stable when they're on the lift. They've all been well ventilated. Um, and in addition, all of the other markers that I study, we collect a sample at the beginning of the process and at the end. We study a lot of different um, blood chemistry markers and we're not seeing any significant changes between those two, at least in the time period that we're handling the animals recognizing that some of those might elevate later. So we are really looking at this process because it is a very novel process and we want to understand how that compares to other procedures where animals are kept in the water. Understanding that if you do study animals and you leave them in the water, you're pretty limited on some of the other types of research that we do. And the truth is in the tracker. We track them for years and years and years after that. That's Bob's famous saying, you know, Truth's in the tracker. You know, you got the markers, she's got their low. We know there's no impact. It'll be published soon. And then you track them for five years and they do the same things each year. So these things are incredibly durable. It's been amazing to learn about that. So this question, we'll make this, because we're butting right up against our hour, but I'll sort of summarize this question and loop it into some other questions that I've seen from People in Nova Scotia, a lot of people asking about our uh, looking forward into the future. Uh, I heard there were some questions about uh, what we think is going on in Cape Breton. Uh, the, them or Heather asking, you know, you think we'll ever go up to Prince Edward Island? So what do you, what do you think are some of the next big steps um, that OSEARCH might take to try and keep solving this white chart puzzle? Chris, I think maybe, do you want to take this yeah, one? Okay. So, yeah, I think it's likely that we'll be up there between PEI and the North Shore of Nova Scotia at some point in the next few years. You know, Jane, one of our sharks, was just up in there 
is a warm area of water in there that's different from around there. We also know that Brunswick, one of our small sharks, went right over the north coast of PEI. Uh, so there's definitely work to be done in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. There's more work to be done in Newfoundland and, and quite a bit more to do uh, on Nova Scotia. We're just There's a lot more sharks up there across a lot bigger area than anyone ever dreamed was possible. It's a I think there's more animals up there than there is off the northeastern United States. It's just a much bigger area, and, and we seem to encounter more animals up there. So that pretty much is exactly our time limit. Uh, um, thank you, everybody. Um, I will uh, go into the comments. If I wasn't able to, if we weren't able to get to your questions right here, um, I'll try and answer them in the comment section or wherever you're watching from. Does anybody have any else, any last uh, words that they want to say before we, we sign off? I'm just grateful for all the people around the world uh, who are participating. It's just can't believe this is, um, you know, what OSEARCH has become. You know, OSEARCH isn't anyone's. It's everyone's. You people are OSEARCH. And, uh, you know, if we're going to be proud of the ocean we leave behind for our kids, it's going to take us all. And that's why we're totally inclusive. And with the tracking and the communication across all the social platforms, the OSEARCH platforms, the shark platforms, and I can't thank the scientists enough. I think a lot of people don't understand when we began the journey at OSEARCH, collaboration amongst different scientists was not how the system was set up. They were all kind of forced to compete against one another, which really limited the rate of learning. And the people you're seeing on the OSEARCH team are the most senior thought leaders in the science space around the world who've left that old individual orientation behind and come together to collaborate and open source and put our great grandchildren first. And that's why OSEARCH is so different. That's why we can learn so much faster. We build big capacity, we share it with everyone if they'll collaborate. Some people don't collaborate. Um, but these people that are on our science team, 30 scientists from 20 institutions, doing 20 research projects on every single animal, the most comprehensively studied white sharks in the world. And it's because of the science team and their, these guys and their ability to, to, you know, a selfless, a common vision and a selfless disposition, ocean first, shark first, grandchildren first. And, and it's humbling to, to be able to work side by side with them. And I'm grateful for them. And, and I'm grateful for all the people that are out there because this is for all our kids and it's going to take us all. And so we all need to be in it together. If we have a, have a last moment, um, speaking for the scientists, Chris, we want to thank you and your crew for everything you've done for us. You've, you've opened the world to us in a way that we didn't think was possible going back 10 years. And I just want to say to all the people out there, people always ask who follow OSEARCH, how can we help? How can we help with shark conservation? How, how can we help with shark research? If you believe in what we're doing, and I hope that we've convinced you of the integrity of that today, contact your, your representatives, contact your agencies, talk to the media, share our site with your friends, talk up OSEARCH. Uh, we need the public support to keep us going and, and places like that, that wonderful question from PEI. Yeah, we wanna come up there. We need permits to do it. So you can help, you can help with that process. Tell us. Tell your, tell your representatives uh, how important this work is, not just to, to us, but to the oceans and to the planet. Excellent. Thank you all for joining us. Thank uh, all, everybody, all of our scientists, everybody who watched live. Um, OSEARCH, uh, you know, obviously things are a little different right now. We plan on keeping this kind of content going. We are doing STEM curriculums on Tuesday, Thursday. We've got these live streams on Wednesday. So everybody... Uh, stay in touch, with, stay uh, up to date with when the, the newest broadcasts are coming on all of our social media channels. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all next time. So uh, until then, uh, we will leave you with that image of Dr. Huter. Stay well, everybody.